focus on death because I fear death. But fear is not my only reason. I focus on death because death is the cessation of consciousness, and consciousness is an astonishing thing, radically unexpected. That consciousness emerges with birth, then winks out with death, troubles me. All religions I know have schemes to disrupt death, offering in one form or another, with ease, life after death. I'd like to be hopeful, but I'm compelled to be skeptical. Some claim evidence for post-mortem survival. Again, I'm a skeptic. Am I cornered, nowhere to go? Bound by angst, I try to break out. Can death be disrupted? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. To disrupt death, if such be possible, I seek a broad perspective. I'd like a landscape of possibilities. To begin, I need context for my angst. I meet an atheistic philosopher who explores personal identity, religion, and death, Julian Bagini. Julian, I'd like to live forever. I'm sure you would too. I know you're a materialist. You don't believe in God. Is life after death even remotely possible? It's possible in one sense, but it's impossible in another. What I mean is this, if you think that what makes us who we are is basically that we are a collection of things, we are an organized system of matter, thought and consciousness, then it's conceivably possible that that system could be reconstructed, got going again, rebooted in some other form, in some other realm. So. If there were um, a God who is omnipotent, then in a way, yes, there's nothing to stop that God reconstituting us in some way, as long as you accept that we don't need to be made of the same physical stuff. But in another way, I think life after death or eternal life isn't really possible for the reason that I think that the kind of people we are is that we're constantly changing. There is a very real sense in which if I say I'm not the person I was aged eight, that's not just metaphorically true, there's something literally true in that. And that if we were to live forever, there would be a continuity, there'd be an unbroken chain between me and someone with my name in say a thousand years time, but in what sense would that person really still be me? So I think we're constantly in flux. We're constantly, as it were, coming out and into existence. The I who exists now begins to fade to exist immediately. And for that reason, I think there's something incoherent in the idea of living forever. Well, certainly to be simple, the physical molecules in our body change over very frequently. So we're not literally the same atoms and molecules that we were a few weeks ago. And we'll have a total change. So we're dealing with the information patterns, the memories, the, the, the subtleties that make ourselves selves. To be a person is to be something that's constantly in flux and changing. And you know, even memories, we build our sense of self and our continuity over time on memory a lot of the time. Memory is actually extremely unreliable, right? And memory is as much a construction of the past as it is a recollection of it. People are convinced they remember things in their childhood, which actually are sometimes checked by other people and turn out to be wrong. So our connections with our past selves are at the best of times relatively weak. And so that means that a connection with the future self in a thousand years, a million years? And eternal you know. beyond that. So there could be an eternal process. There could be, as it were, an eternal succession of selves of which I am one part. But the I who exists now, in order for it to be the same I in a million years' time, would have to be like frozen now and regenerated then. But that's not what life is. The life of a person is to change. So I think we have to embrace the idea that it is of the nature of being a person. It's the nature of existence that change is the only constant. And if we accept that, then we're gonna have no reason to even want for that process of change to go on forever. Well, wait a minute, I followed you up until that point. 
And now you're telling me I don't want the process of change of myself to go on forever. Well, you're dead wrong about that. I want my process of change to go on forever. I think I have a coherence. And when I think back when I was 12 or 15, I mean, I knew no more now when I, than I did then. Uh, but I, I feel like the same person. I know I'm different. But I do want that continuity to go on. I don't want it just metaphorical. I don't want to be a memory in God's uh, imagination or, or, or a, uh, a bunch of uh, a bits in some computer. I would like to live forever. Well, it's possible to want it. It's coherent to want it. Um, and it's also true that if things, unless things are terrible for you at any given point, you'll probably want to have tomorrow, right? <laughs> so in that sense, the desire to live forever is natural. But I think the key point is, if your desire to live forever is based on an idea that in a couple of hundred years' time, that person is really going to be the same person as you, that's a mistake. Mm. For, by all means, desire that the process of which you are a part goes on without end. Don't for one minute think that it means that, you know, there is going to be this core essence of Eunice, which is still there in, in 30 years, in 300 years time, 30 yeah. centuries time. If someone was to say, take a pill now, you live forever. I'm not sure I'll take it. If someone was to say, take this pill now, an extra 30 years, 40 years, healthy life, I'm sure I'd jump at it completely. But we don't have any experience of what it is like to live over really vast time scales. It might turn out to be actually Hell, that might be what hell is, living forever. You get that pill, send it to me. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> I'd gulp the pill, Julian, I'd take the risk. But medicine, no matter how magical, can only add some number of years. And in the endless ocean of everlasting time, any number of years is but a drop. What about uploading one's brain to a non-biological substrate? Can materialistic technology alchemize life after death? My skepticism runneth over. But I ask a philosopher who envisions a transhuman future, Max Moore. Max, you are a philosopher of mind and you are involved in the transhuman is a movement and using technology to radically extend life. So putting those things together, um, is life after death possible? Ah, uh, very tough question. Depending on how we define death, concepts of death are not very well developed and they've, they've been very much based on historical circumstances. So a few decades ago, someone stopped breathing, their heart stopped beating. We said, they're dead, that was it. But now we don't do that. We might call them clinically dead temporarily, but we don't call that real death. They're not even legally dead. What we do is we start doing CPR and defibrillation and so on, and they come back to life. So were they dead? Well, not in any real definite sense. Right, right. I think the same is true today with people that we call dead. What we're really saying is today's medicine can't make this person better. They could maybe revive them temporarily. But the information that's in their brain that stores their personality, that represents who they are, if that's still there, I don't think they're really dead in any final sense. But now if you talk about biological death, yes, you could have life after biological death, the body could die if you could then transfer the patterns of the personality, everything that's stored in your, uh, the patterns of your brain, if you could somehow replicate that in a different substrate, then I think in that sense is life after death as a possibility. Okay, so let's explore that. Certainly if you take all the information in our brains, it's huge, but it is, it is not un unaccessible. There certainly looks to be computing power that will vastly expand the totality of human brain. So, it is conceivable, if you look at all the information in the brain, to upload that. Do you believe that it is, in principle, possible to really upload your, Max's, first-person, subjective experiences, certainly with your memories and personality, into a different medium? I think it is. I'd be very surprised if it, if it weren't. It would require that there be some essentially mystical property of the brain, some kind of magical property that we have no idea of that we can't somehow duplicate. Mm -hmm. Now, even if there was a mysterious property that we haven't discovered yet, presumably, if it's still a physical property, we would eventually discover it and then replicate it. Right, so right. it's not to say that any being walking around, talking like me, acting like me, would actually be me. I think it would be possible um, to create something that spoke like me and appeared to be me, but inside was actually empty. Right, and so. that's a philosophical zombie, as right. I said. But although philosophers like to talk about philosophical zombies, I think that actually be quite hard to construct. I think it'd be easier to create a new being on a new platform who actually was conscious, 
because you're probably going to have to really work hard around that for them Perfect. not to be conscious. It's a lot easier to actually be conscious to act like you're conscious. So let's say that you can upload. It presents the very serious problem, I believe, of duplication. What's the difference between um, uploading me into a, another medium and taking a cell of mine and creating, uh, making it a stem cell and creating a whole other person. That, that other person is my identical twin, but it is not me. It doesn't have my first person experience at all. There are deep problems here. In some sense, you have to say, because of the transitivity of identity, that none of those people are you. They're not identical to you because uh, identity breaks down as a logical relation. But who cares? What I care about is surviving. I don't care about my identity surviving. I want to survive. So I don't care about a logical relationship. I care that my personality, my memories, my values, my goals continue. Now, if they continue on in 10 people, they still continued on. Now, there are real problems because, you know, which one goes with my wife? Which one gets my job? Who gets the property? We're going to divide it up. So there'll be huge practical problems, uh, but those might be you know, solvable in some possible future. Well, there is a difference, though, between your memories, your personalities, and your inner experience of knowing that you're the I behind it, that you have this... No, but they, they would all be the person with the same... They, they would all have the same ancestor. They, they could, each of them could legitimately say, I am a continuer of no, the they, they certainly would say that. But if you're sitting here and you, and you have your sense and somebody told me we just uploaded you, would you feel any different? No. You're sitting here. You wouldn't, no, feel any I wouldn't feel any different. Except in the sense that this is kind of a classic thought experiment. What if you offered me a billion dollars if you could kill me and you, you know, give the billion dollars to my yeah, and you offered right, right. I would say, okay, because I don't think I'm losing anything. It's just like I've moved across the room from one body to another, in effect. There's no further fact of my identity. It just is the collection of all these properties that make me who I am. Now, if we diverged, if we'd been living apart for a year or longer, or a microsecond, we'd, be, we'd I mean, be very different. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm asking just at that precise instant what you're defining as, as different, because I, I, I think you're, you fully answer the question by saying, when you've duplicated the 10 others, I confirm, you've talked to them, but you personally, your I does not feel any difference whatsoever. No, no. And therefore, I, I would argue that all of those others are very, very close identical twins of yours, but they're not you. If you die, you die. If you had made a billion dollars, had that billion dollar bet, uh, one of your, one of your twins uh, really had a very stupid progenitor. Well, see, I don't, don't see it that way. I think if, if it's literally microseconds, then we're practically identical. I don't think anything is really being lost, again, because I don't think there's a soul that's unique to each of those individuals. Uh, but the more they diverge, the more of a problem that would be. I don't think it's really that different than uh, if you know, during my sleep, someone came and did some brain damage or a blood vessel blew and it changed, you know, I lost a bunch of memories and personality. Uh, I think that'd be a lot worse than uh, ending my life and having something absolutely identical to me continuing from that point. But you, as that inner, pers uh, that inner personal I that you feel now, would, would, would have ceased to exist. See, I think it's extremely counterintuitive. I know it's very hard to, to say, how could you possibly think that would be okay to do that? But I think it's based on an intuition from our long history of thinking that we are really something other than our bodies, that we actually are a soul or something that exists beyond the collection of these qualities of psychological connectedness. I think. It's a very hard intuition to shake, but I really do, do think that I wouldn't lose anything if, if I just uploaded and you destroyed the original body. I'm not saying I wouldn't be concerned, because uh, it's very hard to shake that even for myself, having thought about it for, for a long time. But I think I shouldn't be concerned. It's not a rational concern. Max and I, we're both sure about what counts. He goes for survival of personality, memories, values. I go for continuity of inner awareness. Sure, I'd want to take along my personality, memories, values, but continuity is what counts, and I'm skeptical that uploading my brain can continue my mind. Duplicates, replicates may be indistinguishable from the original, even in principle, but when felt inside, how can they be identical to the original? Max thinks it doesn't matter. I think it's all that matters. My dispute with Max is fundamental. What happens to my first-person inner experience? A strong materialist, Max dismisses the notion that there's anything mystical or magical about consciousness. Notions of a soul, he believes, are myths. Some see evidence of survival from so-called near-death experiences. I'm criticized for dismissing such anecdotal reports. Do I err? 
I hear of an intensive care physician and medical scientist who makes new claims, Sam Parnia. Sam, your work in studying the nature of consciousness during cardiac arrest, what some people would call near-death experiences, uh, some would say cast doubt on the, on the scientific uh, assumption that life after death is impossible. Do you think that's right? Going through the science of it, we don't have all the answers today, but I think we've made enormous strides to answer the question of what happens when we die. We have to remember that when death is a process, okay, and just because a person has died and they've been given a time of death declared and, and essentially, uh, uh, you know, called a corpse, the cells inside the person's body have not become so damaged that we can't bring them back. So as science has progressed, we are now able to manipulate those processes for hours after death and bring back a whole person and study their consciousness during that time, which was impossible until very recently, right? And so the incredible discovery through this is, one is that we can bring back people and send them home. We can really have the miracle of science, take someone who's dead and make them alive again, which is amazing. But the other amazing part of this is that we can study what people experience when they've gone beyond death. And the evidence so far suggests that that entity we call the human mind, consciousness, what the Greeks called the psyche that was later translated into the soul, the me, Sam, does not become annihilated just after a person has died, even if we write them a death note and, and certify them as being dead. That entity continues. And it continues even when the brain does not seem to be functioning. Raising the question that consciousness may be a separate entity from the brain. It's not magical, it's just not discovered yet, but it doesn't die. Now, I can't tell you what happens three hours, four hours, ten hours after a person has died. I can't tell you whether consciousness gradually fades away and disappears into thin air, as some people might believe. Or does it continue for ever longer periods of time? Certainly, the bodily functions, bodily cells will die with time. There's no doubt about that. What happens to our real self-consciousness is that, as I explained, it continues for a period of time. Now you have to make your own conclusions. I don't have evidence beyond that, which is one of two ways. One is that you may say, well, okay, I'm going to accept that consciousness may continue for a few hours after death in some, end, some format and gradually wither away. Or you may also argue that, well, if consciousness was able to continue when the brain was not functioning, why would it suddenly disappear away a few hours later? Because don't forget, even 10 minutes after you've died, or even 30 seconds after you've died, your brain does not function anymore. Even when we do CPR, when we try to resuscitate someone, there's not enough blood that gets into the brain to enable the brain to function. Even during resuscitation, the brain remains flatlined. And so what happens? Well, Certainly there is life after death for a period of time. Does it continue forever? I don't know. But certainly for a period of time afterwards, uh, consciousness remains. I am paying attention. I see why near-death data can be compelling, but still I'm stuck in skepticism. My doctorate is in brain science, and the simplest explanation is that consciousness can continue for a short time beyond clinical death, even if brain electrical activity appears flatlined. After all, the person was resuscitated. How else could he or she report the near-death experience? Resuscitation is no resurrection. So to me, no good evidence of a soul, little hope for uploading, Putting aside religion, death seems undisruptible. I seek a philosopher who, while not believing in a personal theistic God, is willing to consider ultimate matters beyond the physical. John Schellenberg. John, you're an atheist. Mm -hmm. And yet, you're not quite as willing as others to dismiss life after death. Why is that? I've gone back and forth on this afterlife question. Um, I feel the tug from science and from the, the great influence that science has in our culture, but precisely because of how great that influence is, I'm also inclined to wonder whether there might be something that we're missing and to be open uh, to at least thinking about how there could be such a thing as life after death. There are various other influences that, that have me a skeptic on the issue as opposed to a disbeliever. One of them concerns um, the question of what consciousness is. If we could 
say that consciousness is entirely reducible to, to you know, some, something about the physical brain, um, then, then perhaps I would have to be a, a disbeliever instead of a skeptic. But I think that we still may have a very long way to go in trying to understand consciousness. And consciousness, of course, is at the heart of the afterlife question. So if I'm a skeptic about the nature of consciousness, how can I help but be a skeptic about the afterlife instead of a disbeliever? We're still at a very early stage in this whole process of intelligent inquiry on our planet. Part of my thinking about that, about our place in time, has led me to be a skeptic about a, an important religious proposition, which I call ultimism, which is the claim that there is a reality that is uh, ultimate, both in the nature of things and value, and in what it can contribute to the value of our own lives. All right. I'm a skeptic for various reasons about that religious claim. But that religious claim entails that there is an afterlife. This is one of the interesting features that it has. You might think that it's barren of content, that it's just empty by comparison with something like theism. But one of the implications I've had to face up to, one of the implications of ultimism is that there is an afterlife for at least some of us. Why? Well, because it just strains credulity to think that some of the people who have lived on this planet, who have died perhaps very early, who have lived very horrendous lives, that they should really have had uh, access to, to soteriological ultimacy just, you know, it strains credulity, right? So if there really is a soteriological ultimate, uh, a religious ultimate, then there must be an afterlife. That's an implication. And so if I'm skeptical about ultimism, I'm going to be skeptical as well about uh, this matter of the afterlife, which is all bound up with it. Because you need an afterlife, potentially, to make your ultimism have any, any teeth to it. Yeah, what does it need to have teeth? Well, it needs at least not to be such that we should believe it to be false. <laughs> a very fair. minimal condition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really all you need, because so long as you don't believe it to be false, if you're in doubt about it, it is an appropriate object of what I call uh, skeptical faith. Well, you could have an ultimism that just has uh, metaphysical foundations sure. that the universe or the laws of mm. physics or have some brute fact existence and there's nothing else yep. behind it, that there is no values in the world, everything is all chance, and that we therefore have no personal mm. connection, human beings are actually... You could have like what would properly be called an ultimate reality that way. It would just be a thinner one, a metaphysically ultimate reality of the yes. sort that even science is seeking. All sure. right? But you wouldn't have what satisfies the description of what I'm calling ultimism. I've given a name to this claim that it needs a name because people have often distinguished between religious claims like theism and the more general idea that there's something. They say there's something. So well, your ultimism is a, a religious claim. It's a religious claim. It's a religious yeah. claim. It's a, it's a divine claim, but it's not a theistic claim. That's right. And is, for that, you absolutely need an afterlife to make well, sense of it. Well, as I see it now, if somebody could show me that ultimism could be true without any afterlife, I, I might be comforted by that, strangely enough, because you might think I'd want there to be an afterlife. Uh, but intellectually, I might be comforted by that, precisely because science makes it so hard for us to believe in an afterlife at all. But I think looking at things properly with the philosophical attitude of wanting to understand for its own sake, not to build up any ideology, whether that be religious or naturalistic, I think we ought to be skeptics instead. But if your ultimism has a religious claim to it, yes. how can you have a religious claim, knowing the world as it is, mm. without an afterlife? Well, that's what I find very hard to see, and that's why I say that I think, at present, <laughs> that ultimism entails that there is an afterlife, or at least some of us. I mean, some of us have a pretty good go at things in this life, uh, but plenty of us don't. And so there would need to be an afterlife in order for the potential of such individuals to have any hope of being realized. And I think that religion promises that the potential of all of us at least can be realized. I'd go with you to the conclusion, except I can't differentiate. You can have the greatest life in the world. You could be the king uh -huh. of Persia for 80 years or 100 years. Yeah. And if you're losing eternity, that, that's as, if, as mm. if nothing. So afterlife is for everybody or for no, nobody. Everybody as far or as nobody. Okay. okay, I can see why you might go that, that route. There's a specific I'm question. with John that it strains credulity. If the universe has ultimate meaning, if existence has ultimate purpose, and there is no life after death. Of course, there may be no ultimate meaning or purpose. That would be coherent, if unhappy, and consistent with science. But to me, wishful thinker that I am, it just doesn't ring true. 
For the same reason that consciousness seems such an astonishing thing, radically unexpected, permanent death winking out consciousness also seems absurd. Honestly, all the imagined responses to death, religious and otherwise, seem bizarre, contradictory. So, how could death be disrupted? Four ways. One, non-physical soul or spirit. Two, resurrection by God or something like God. Three, cosmic force or principle like cosmic consciousness. Four, upload to a non-biological substrate. Not thrilled with these choices? Well, it strains credulity that there is nothing. That's my credo, striving to get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.